welcome to the Thriving Farmers Podcast, where our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable and sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to clean their top takeaways in business and life. Vern Grubinger is the vegetable and berry specialist and extension educator with the University of Vermont and coordinator of USDA's Northeast SARE program. In this interview, we draw on Vern's several decades as an educator and extension agent and talk about the changes, innovations, and breakthroughs he's seen over the years. We discuss how he suggests new farmers get started, how culture to share learning has only brought the industry forward, and untapped resources that farmers can use to innovate and grow their farms. Welcome to the podcast, Vern. Great to be here. Can you give us a little bit more about your background and what you do on a day-to-day basis? I'm the vegetable and berry specialist for University of Vermont Extension. So I provide technical advice to commercial growers, but really I usually say I'm part of a co-learning community. So I'm helping to spread the knowledge around that is held in part by experts and researchers and extension, but also to a great extent by the farmers themselves. So I'm trying to create a learning community where people can share what they've learned, their experiences, avoid reinventing the wheel and you know make progress, not just for themselves, but for their peers. What attracted you originally to the, the farming industry? I always liked growing things. I grew up in suburbia and I had gardens and then in college, took some plant and soil science courses and had some great professors and got out on the university farms. And that was the start of it. I had been working in food service through junior high and high school. And I sort of felt like I wanted to get at the root of food. I didn't want to be cooking it. I wanted, (laughs) I wanted to know where it came from. And uh, that was, was reinforced as I learned more about farming. And then I think a really pivotal experience for me was in graduate school, organic certification was just starting. Mm -hmm. They needed people to go out and visit farms and had a little checklist to convert, confirm that people were doing certain things, but it ended up being conversations and people would ask me questions. Well, what about this? And where do you think I should do about that? And often I found myself saying, well, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. And that has sort of become my career mantra, <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> you know, trying to find things out that farmers want to know that will be helpful. And the good part of it is you learn stuff along the way. So the second or third time I'm asked, I already have that in my head or written down somewhere. So it kind of builds on itself. Plus I get the fun of, you know, learning something every day. Mm. What were the early days like in New England agriculture? Well, you mean from when I was around? (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah. So way back in the day, I mean. Yeah, when you started. I think it was a transition from what I call, at least on the extension side, spray and pray. There was just like a lot of emphasis on chemical solutions to problems and it has become much more holistic people still apply agrochemicals fertilizers pesticides you know organic or conventional but it's more a systems thinking approach now of understanding the life cycle of pests understanding soil health writ large and also going beyond production to the more challenging aspects of farming really right the business management, the Mm. HR, the land issues, the labor issues, the marketing issues. So I would say it's just become a more holistic conversation than it was when I started. It was really about conventional production. Yeah. Yeah. There's still the, the green revolution aspects of that. So what does sustainable agriculture and more specifically a sustainable farm mean to you? And, you know, some people don't like that word sustainable. So, you know, if there's another word you like, feel free to to share. I'm way past the wordsmithing stage. I mean, you can beat these things into the ground and come up with new terms. And, um, but I think the intent is clear that people are, you know, striving to do better environmentally, economically, socially with quality of life. And it's, so to me, that it's an aspiration. It's not a metric. It's not a standard like, you know, organic with their specific things. And I always use human medicine as a analogy where you go into the doctor's office. You don't want to hear about whether the person before you was healthy or, or not, or how you compare. It's really your individual process of improving things. And mm. that's 
the bottom line to me is like every farm can be more sustainable. It's not that there are farms that are sustainable and those that aren't. It's just what is on your radar to improve the long-term viability of your farm. That's what I want to know. Absolutely. So as an extension agent and educator, how do you know what to focus on? Um, you know, what are your big theme priorities these days? Well, listening is the key of hearing what farmers are asking about. And so once I get three calls or emails about the same topic, it's a little flag goes up like, hmm, something's yeah. <laughs> going on here. There's <laughs> a bunch of people asking about the same thing. Or if I'm making farm visits and you see the same challenge or problem or even you know, solution, a new thing that a few people are doing that others might want to know about. You focus on that. Sometimes things are forced upon us, like there's a new regulation. And we've got to step up to the plate to comply in, you know, the most practical and useful way possible. So it's just about paying attention. And then some things get resolved and you move on. Others becomes a dull roar of people going through, you know, the steps that they need to do, but it's not like an urgent need anymore. So yeah. You know, spotted wing drosophila shows up. Everyone's in a total tizzy. What's it going to mean? What do we do? And then people start to understand the pests better and the solutions. And it's not like it's not a problem, but um, yeah. the better understanding and better options that have been tried or proven. Produce safety, another one. You know, a new law gets passed. It's kind of freak out time and people project <laughs> their own narrative onto what it means. And then things settle down. You start to understand, oh, Okay, so I have to do these things. Yeah. All these processes to help me with that. It's going to cost me this much to get set up to do it. And then it's just part of my standard operating procedures. Yeah. So back to the SWD, what is the thought process on that now? How are growers dealing with that? It depends a little bit where you are, how much pressure. So in northern New England, it's not as bad as, as you go further south. Some people have shifted crops, right? Like fall raspberries, if you're not. Mm -hmm. To do some interventions are really problematic, late season blueberries. Um, smaller scare growers have adopted netting in some cases. Certainly just the, all the cultural practices of pruning properly to get air and light in there, timely harvesting, getting the fruit into refrigeration as soon as possible. Mm. They're all things people can do. And then, yeah, some, some kind of a rational spray schedule if you're going to do that and you know, organically. It's been a challenge. There are fewer materials, but people have figured out something where they have a lot on the line and they need some protection. Yeah. So, yeah, there are strategies that definitely can, can work. There still are always the people that come out of the woodwork that surprise me. Haven't heard of this thing. You know, it tends to be smaller growers. They got a half an acre of blueberries or something. They're not connected to the associations and the newsletters. And yeah, you know, they want to know what disease is making my fruit rot and plain hey, there's this new insect. And so that's always of interest to me of uh, this continuum of connectedness of producers. Some people really are in the loop and always retrieving the latest, greatest information. And other people are pretty isolated. They're just focused on their own enterprise. And They're reacting instead of being, you know, uh, going out there and, and thinking ahead of the problem. Right. And as I say, sometimes smaller producers in particular, this is not their number one income source or activity. Yeah. So they're busy. Everyone's busy. I'm not criticizing. Just it's part of the challenge of being in the education business, right? That you've got an audience that's coming at you from all different backgrounds and understanding levels and needs. And people have vastly different investments on the line. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I'm thankful that I don't deal with gardeners very much because much as I love them, they're a lot of work and you know, <laughs> yes. it's mostly just for pleasure. So it's, you don't yeah. want to spend that much time on that. So that's what we have master gardeners for. Yes, absolutely. So talk to me one final question about this, the, the netting, does the netting affect the plants in other ways besides excluding the bugs? Does it reduce the amount of airflow? Does it cause other problems? Not to my knowledge. It's okay. porous as far as air and light and water moving through it. And the other benefit you have is it keeps birds off, which is yes. uh, oh, yeah. a twofer. Yeah. And, you know, it's costly. You have to have a structure. It's not that long lived necessarily, but you um, can take it down. You know, you only need to protect ripe berries, so it doesn't have to be up there very long. And so if you take good care of it and buy the thicker kinds of material, yeah, I've had it on my blueberries for, let's see, when did this all start? 2011, so going on nine years now. Got a few tears in it. I use binder clips to close up, but yep. it's been very effective. 
Okay. All right. So as an extension agent, as you said, there's all things coming from you at all sides. Uh, what do you feel like are the, the daily habits that contribute to, you know, keeping up with all of this to that, to that success? I learned a lot from people that came before me and were mentors. And, you know, one thing I always tell new people coming in, you need to have a few areas of focus mm. where you can develop some expertise, get more details about what you know, and kind of have some areas to hang your hat on. And roughly speaking, that should be half of your time. That, and the other half is much more chaotic. You're just responding to inquiries, networking, going to meetings, getting new training. It's That part isn't necessarily building any robust projects and outcomes, mm. but that's got to happen too. But just having that awareness of there are really these two very distinct kind of buckets. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you better not let the latter squeeze the former too much or you just running around a lot and doing all ad hoc stuff all the time. And at you know, the end of the year or the decade or your career, all you can do is say, I answered a lot of questions and went to a lot of meetings. Yes. Which is yes. pretty much how I feel a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So in your career, what have been some of the biggest challenges they've seen farmers face and uh, some of, what are some of the innovative ways they have responded? That's a big question. As you know, there are just so many challenges. Um, yeah. And, you know, I guess starts the beginning of, you know, getting on the land is a huge one for some. So some people inherit a farm or uh, have resources to buy a farm and others are in a place where farmland's limited, it's expensive, there's competition. So, they solve it by building relationships and leasing and moving around, being flexible until they have the assets, hopefully, to get a permanent location. So that that's the land is a, is a big one. Markets is another one. And I mean, so much that's come into focus for me over the years is, is it's all about relationships. <laughs> you know? yeah. So whether it's having access to land or building markets or managing HR effectively, you got to have people skills and put the time in to build trust and some kind of mutually beneficial arrangement around these different things. Because in the end, for all, all the challenges of growing things, that's actually the easy part. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I kind of laugh because that's what I was trained in and most of my colleagues, right? We were production people. Yeah. And it's kind of an eye opener that if, if you ask growers, which we've done this last year, visiting farms, we did like 60 kind of semi-formal intake forms. Oh, wow. You know, it takes about 10 minutes, but just yeah. going down the list of what's on your mind. But one thing we started asking was, at the 10,000 foot level, what are your major concerns? Mm. You know, and nobody says how to grow vegetables. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's, you know, labor, labor, markets and regulation, climate change, those are the big ones that you see up there when people are thinking long-term and holistically. Um, yeah. So those are not easy things to like do a little research trial and write a fact sheet up on, right? Which yeah. Kind of been the old MO, like, oh, we'll try these different varieties, compare them, tell you what we found, or do some different fertilizer rates or cover crops or grow different, different temperatures. All the things that applied research has done and does well you can't really follow that model for these much more complex problems. So that's where I've been excited about fostering the farmer farmer communication through, mm -hmm. you know, listservs and newsletters where the growers write in, I don't write at all. And, you know, having conferences where panels of producers complemented by some researchers and extension to, because it's um, personal intertwined sets of decisions that again, they're, they're not, they're not formulaic. Mm. It's really somebody, the farmer's got to synthesize what they hear from others and apply it in a way that makes sense in their own context. Mm, absolutely. So you mentioned climate change there. Now, Hurricane Irene came through. Was that 2011? Yes, it was. And that caused some major challenges in Vermont. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we lost, say, say about 10% of the vegetable farms were severely affected, all the people on floodplains and also some people on more upland, but where, where the rainfall was super intense. So yeah, that was a difficult year. And it also, you know, some of it was physical loss, but it was also an eye opener as far as 
Food and Drug Administration's view of floodwaters, and most of us didn't know if, wow, an edible crop touches floodwater, it's considered contaminated and you're not supposed to sell it. Yeah. So this was about the same time, you know, FISMA was in the works and that really shifted a lot of our uh, energy and conversations towards produce safety. Yeah. I remember we got, we got about four acres flooded. And, um, you know, when you, I think I emailed you and was like, Hey, what's going on? What are we supposed to do? And you came back with, yeah, you're really not supposed to be selling or eating that because contaminated. Yeah. That was a major loss. Yeah. But, which, you know, I yeah. can understand it's lettuce, tomatoes, but it was, that was a bitter pill to swallow for butternut squash, <laughs> you know, things yes. that are going to get peeled and cooked and yes. just yes. like that does not seem yes. particularly risky, but that's the law of the land. So it's one of those things where, you know, there's kind of two kinds of education the way I view it, uh, helping people with information for things they want, <laughs> and yes. then helping people with, help with things they need that they don't necessarily want. And there's a lot, unfortunately, in that latter bucket these days. Yeah, especially the food safety part. But the good news is most of the folks I work with and, you know, we've collaborated with farmers a lot on our small scale food safety program, the same we have a new water quality, nutrient management law. There, there are ways to make these things into win-win. Mm-hmm. And that's really what farmers are doing anyway is, right, synthesizing all this. You don't think just produce safety, it's produce safety, it's quality, it's storage, it's markets, it's uh, materials handling and efficiency. So when you start to put that all together, wow, when you address some of these concerns you're obligated to, ideally there are actually other benefits like in the quality and the shelf life of crops. And so that's what makes it all achievable. Well, and a lot of this too is about knowing your numbers and having that, that especially the food safety, the records part is now you can look at all these records and start synthesizing that data and know where your farm is making money and not making money. So that's incredibly helpful. Yeah. And again, the learning community. So, you know, Hans Estrin here in Vermont runs CAPS, the Community Accreditation for Produce Safety, which... Mm -hmm. We really built with with the advice of producers, like, okay, what do you think is important in produce safety? And they came up with 18 areas that address most of what the regulators want too, but in a very practical way and also eliminated some of the stuff that just not a good use of time to go over the top with. And then by creating a online platform where there's pictures of SOPs and washing arrangements and pack sheds, you know, the growers can start seeing each other's systems and Mm. adopting best practices. So that's where it gets really exciting. Like, whoa, you know, I hadn't thought of doing it that way. Yeah. Saves time, it saves money, improves quality. And that's, again, a fringe benefit of this whole challenge that seemed kind of overwhelming when it was first rolled out. Yeah. So you mentioned mentors a little bit ago. There are a ton of people in this industry that have shared so much. Tell me about some of the more influential lessons you've learned from some of those. For me, a person that really stands out was a gentleman named Ray Pessel. He had been the county agent here in my county for 32 years. I was hired. This, I started as a county agricultural agent back when we had them in Vermont. And he was a private consultant when I came on board, but he really just helped me get grounded. He took me around to visit farms. He showed me the issues and introduced me to folks, etc. But what I really learned from him was just the skills that I was going to need to acquire that I didn't have very well developed at the time, which uh, again was really the the listening, the ability to you know assess needs of farmers by hearing, looking, talking, comparing, and also his flexibility. So he was an old school post World War II extension mm. guy who became an advocate of IPM and a supporter of organic and was able to go with the flow where, where farmer interests were going because he wasn't a judgmental person at all. So I've often said recently, you know, I'm not in the judgment business. Mm. I don't say, Oh, there's a good farmer. There's a bad farmer. That person, that's the right way to do it. That's the wrong way. It's more meeting people where they're at and trying to understand where they want to go. And yeah, sharing, Hey, I saw someone doing it this way. That seems like it would, could be better for you. Yeah. It's, you know, it's your call. I mean, yeah, occasionally you have to say, whoa, that's illegal. You really can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a different thing. You know, that's a gift that I have in my job and extension in general, right? We, we don't have yeah. anything to sell. We're not regulating anybody. We don't have yeah. to tell anybody what to do. It's really, we're either useful or not. So that's a gift and it's a scary thing. And I got that through my head really early on of, wow, I was dealing with people, been 
knew a lot more about farming than I did, and I was supposed to be advising them. Yeah. So that's where the whole co-learning community came in, is, and that's what I also learned from some of my mentors, is you bring people together, there's a lot of knowledge in the room, and you're trying to you know, capture that and your your job is kind of to uh, organize the group, but also then synthesize the conversation, the findings into something useful, actionable, especially for people that weren't there. Absolutely. That's, that is really good. So let's talk a little bit about starting farms. If there was a magic reset button as it relates to that, what systems would you like to see farmers put into place sooner rather than later? The traction that soil health has right now across the country, you know, I think is really important and everybody kind of understood in a way in the back of their mind, but the the principles and the practices are getting much more clearly articulated of, you know, reducing tillage, having more ground cover, having more live cover, having more cover crops in the system, thinking about systems that allow you to do that, whether it's permanent beds, conservation tillage equipment, tarping, mulching. I mean, it's a really exciting time because this is all just sort of starting to come together for vegetable growers. I mean, large, you know, corn and soybean, the traditional method of spraying stuff down and tilling into it is planting into it is not really appropriate to vegetables. And, you know, in vegetable farms, the crops are so different. So my view is probably going to have tillage for carrots for a long time to come. Small seeded crops that need that fluffy seed bed. Yeah. But you're rotating with a lot of things where you really can avoid a lot of tillage and that's what people are figuring out. So that's, that's kind of the reset button is, you know, if soil health had been a top priority a while back, we probably would have beaten up soils quite so much. Yeah. When I started, I mean, rotivating a field multiple times a year was not uncommon. (laughs) Yeah. So do you see, are there some large vegetable farms that are doing well with the, or a reduced tillage system? Well, again, it's crop by crop, right? Yeah. So, and also I work with a lot of organic growers where obviously it's more challenging if you're just going to yeah. do this physically, but there's been work certainly with, with the winter squash family, pumpkins and squashes and corn. Those are kind of the obvious suspects, right? Of you have some residue, if you don't kill it with uh, chemicals, can you crimp it? Can you roll it? And it gets tricky real fast, right? You need enough residue to actually suppress the weeds. Yeah. Because you can't get in there and cultivate anymore. And especially up north, you also want the soil to warm enough so that you don't lose crop yield. So you see people doing a good job with strip kinds of systems where there is a bare area that things are transplanted or seeded into. And uh, there's residue in between. And there's been a lot of work with the zone tillers, people with just rotivating smaller areas the tarping is really, I think, has a lot of potential mm-hmm. for um, combining with a reduced tillage system. So, yeah, there was a presentation at a recent conference, a farm up in Canada's tarping after, you know, leafy greens and then just using a lately instead of a rotivator like they always have mm-hmm. and, and actually drilling you know, seed, you know, leafy green seed into that. So, so much depends on, on the crop and um, weed pressure and things like that. So, I, I kind of feel like we're in first grade with this at this point that, mm. you know, it's going to be exciting as, as we learn more. But um, right now I'm urging farmers to just experiment on a small scale with your different crops and um, certainly getting more cover crops into rotation and taking land out of crops that require tillage is a tried and true yeah. approach. But if you're land limited, it's a hard sell. So you're pretty much going to stick with winter covers. Yeah. But even there, I don't know, throwing some stuff in between the rows at last cultivation, certainly sneaking in buckwheat and things in between crops. So people are doing all these things. It's just what's the right balance on your own farm that still lets you grow enough cash crops to make a living. Exactly. Because that's the key is to make sure the farm still stays profitable. What is the biggest mistake that you see beginning farmers make? You know, like, um, is it not marketing well enough, growing too many crops, trying to get too big too fast? You know, I, I don't know that there's one. I think there are areas of concern. Not having clarity about your place in the market mm. be one of them. So you see people, you know, they want to have a CSA and a roadside stand and sell to the co-op, which is already being done by 10 other farmers in the area. Mm. So is there more market there? Or are you just cannibalizing? That's concern where other people come in like, hey, I'm going to do, you know, winter root crops that are is not saturated. Or I've had 
some farms in my town where they start with a vegetable idea and actually move to, to local meat. <laughs> to yeah. Sales. They didn't really have the best land for vegetables anyway. And that was very competitive and went to an enterprise that was, you know, kind of where vegetables were 30 years ago is emerging. As a, yeah. So, and especially once we got some more slaughter capacity around, it became more viable. So thinking hard about the market and doing some research, talking to a lot of people, the buyers at, the stores, the other people at a farmer's market, just trying to have some niches identified and then staying focused on those and doing them well instead of overextending into different marketing channels. Yeah. But again, to build the relationships for success all require bandwidth and just can't manage that many of them. You know, that's one. I think the other challenge sometimes is rushing onto the land and this is happens in so many cases just because you want to get to it. But um, yeah. Being able to improve the soil for some period of time before you actually grow crops, both for the soil health and to control perennial weeds, things like that, that's helpful if you can do it. So a big plus is if you have an off-farm income or your yeah. partner does, or you know, if you don't have to rush into it and you can build the foundational pieces, collect some of that equipment, explore the markets, build the soils, get some infrastructure in place, it's just less stressful than trying to do all that and farm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because it's on one aspect, you're trying to run a business. But on the other aspect, you're trying to build that business. And those are two different <laughs> different areas and doing them at the same time can be challenging. Yeah. You know, and I just met with someone yesterday, came into my office, which is a really good example of the right way to do it. They were looking for land for a long time. You know, they had their regular job. They were saving their money. They found a really nice piece of ground with a good marketing opportunity. They've been doing farming and on the side, renting some land, a small scale. They've been collecting equipment. They have some market knowledge. They've got all the soil tests of this land. They are penciling out different configurations of infrastructure before they build anything. You know, they went to the Proto Safety Alliance training, doing the mm. management trainings, you know, small business training. Like they're, they're getting their brain lined up to actually start the thing. <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. And when they do, they won't have to be helter-skelter trying to accomplish all those other things, a lot of which just gets squeezed out from just demands of production. <laughs> Hey, Michael here. I hope you are enjoying this episode so far. If you are looking to shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources. There we have a resource bundle, which contains a bunch of different eBooks that we put together over the years on everything from winter growing, wash and shed efficiency, pastured poultry processes, building your farm and buying the right property. One of the resources I want to highlight is our profitable farmers toolkit downloaded by over 3000 farmers. It's a free resource. It contains tips for setting up your farm, financial systems and apps that you can use to track your farm, our favorite tools for the greenhouse, field and wash and shed, innovative apps for farming and how to put automated systems in place to make your farm run more efficiently. So if you haven't already, pop on over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download it today. So in working with farmers, what one strategy or, or system that if um, more farmers and their teams could consistently apply would compound into the big wins for them? I think you just mentioned something right there of, you know, focusing on lining up everything before you start executing. But is there anything else that you could see farmers focusing on in their business on a day-to-day -day basis? An obvious one for me, and it's self-serving, but is get out there and attend the conferences, go to the on-farm workshops, take the courses, you know, they're just so many ways people reinvent the wheel because they didn't see how some other farmers were doing it or they set up a system only to have to redesign it later when they realize there was a better way to do it. And as you, we were talking about earlier before we started, you know, there's a lot of information that's just not out there in a mm -hmm. educational format there. You can't pick up a book or watch a video or, you know, it's really, yeah. I mean, the on-farm workshops are probably at the pinnacle of that to really, see what other farmers are doing. And again, you can go visit farms and that's fine if you have the welcome mat laid out for you. But I always tell people, like I don't give out names of farms for people to go visit. That's just yeah. not fair. That's why they host workshops where they take the time to really share the information. And even if you have to drive a ways, you know, those can be invaluable if you just take home a couple of insights that you're going to apply. I mean, a great farmer I have known for a long time, Bob Gray up at Four Corners Farm. When I started, I remember him saying, you know, if I learn one thing at a workshop, 
it justifies the whole day. <laughs> you know, yes. one, one thing that I can bring back and put to use on the farm. So that's the way you have to be thinking. I, I know far too many farmers who just tell me they're too busy to go to things. And I think you just need to find some balance of get out enough, especially when there's a farm that really is a lot like what you're doing or what you think you want to do. Yeah. And, you know, so often you see farmers featured that have, this is, this is the culmination of their 30 years, 40 years of farming. Right. So you're, yeah, you know, I feel bad. Like for beginning farmers, we're not saying you should be like this right away, but you know, these are people who have worked out a ton of stuff, <laughs> you know, and they're letting you see it. It's pretty amazing. Why would you yeah. not do that? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I remember, you know, Paul and Sandy Arnold ran those tours. They still run tours in the Hudson Valley for years. And those early years, it was such a struggle to actually go because, you know, by the time, if you're going a couple hours south, you were leaving midday and you're driving down there. But one we did go to, the guy had an entire greenhouse of cherry tomatoes, double liter, you know, right up to the ceiling. And I looked at that and I was like, Oh my gosh. And so the next year we absolutely did that. And that one day paid off so much just because we, we implemented that one strategy and it made us a lot of money bringing on, you know, early cherry tomatoes in our market was something that hadn't been done before. And we really were able to make it work for us. So yeah, I absolutely say, you know, those on farm trainings. And I think that the Northeast is especially well known for that and does an incredible job of that. Um, some of these other states, it's just the, this community of sharing, like you said, is not as advanced as it, as it could be. And so, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a huge, I think, win for farms to get off their own farm and go see what other people are doing. It is a really special thing in this area that farmers will just share so generously <laughs> everything they're doing and, you know, often talk about the numbers too. And I think it's a rising tide lifts all boats, comes back, they get it back from others. I mean, there are very few farmers who like, I want people seeing what I'm doing. So that's just something to acknowledge um, that's worth capitalizing on. And I think that the way I look at this issue of taking the time, it's it's kind of like a long-term investment, right? You're actually, it's actually might cost you money today to go do that. <laughs> yeah. But as you say, if you come back with something that earns you thousands of dollars a year for the next several years or more, it's a great use of your time. It's hard to know if you're going to get that or when you're going to get it. But I think there's also a lot of intangibles, right? You just in your own mind, you start to synthesize. Hmm, I saw that. I saw this. I saw that. Now I can actually make a quantum leap to another kind of system because I have these different pieces in my head that I've observed. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I know it's just that one little tip from one farm, then one little tip from another. But then the other aspect too is the kinds of people that show up to these tours are the ones that are breaking the mold. And so just the interaction there, that farmer to farmer interaction with the other attendees can be invaluable as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great thing. It's nothing, nothing like the on-farm learning, that's for sure. So one challenge that many farms face is uh, finding, hiring, and keeping great teams. And, and we mentioned that earlier. You know, how do you see successful farms hiring great team members? Well, this is one of the biggest concerns, obviously, is labor. And produce farms have a big challenge for a number of reasons. So like most of agriculture, it's hard work and it's long hours and pay is not great compared to a lot of other opportunities. And then the seasonality of it is tricky for retention. Although more and more farms are, you know, they're doing more things in the winter with winter crops and marketing, et cetera. So there's, there's that. And then there's the intangible too, that a lot of the really good workers want to have their own farms someday. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, you're not going to keep them for the long haul. They're going to move on and start their own thing. So some of the farms I see doing a good job with HR, A, they recognize that last part, that there's going to be a cycling of workers through and you can't really be mad when you're, the best ones go on and leave because that's what they planned all along. But Hopefully you have someone next in the pipeline ready to step up into that slot. Hmm. As long as they go far enough away, not a problem. Instead of, you know, if they're in retail that they don't set up right next to you. And there's a lot of that going on in my neck of the woods. A lot yeah. of the older established farmers have trained, you know, so many other farmers out there work on their farm one way or another. And then when you get to any scale around here, most people go to H2A. Mm -hmm. yes. There isn't, you need so many <laughs> reliable, hardworking people that there's just not enough locals. And that's the reality of the way it is right now. H2A is a really important piece for the larger horticulture farms. Mm. Um, some people have a good mix. Um, there are some bigger farms that are still mostly local. 
one thing I do observe, you know, it helps to be able to have fun <laughs> to be, yeah. you know, you have to be serious and demanding too, but um, there's a lot to be said for letting people enjoy themselves in some way, have some, um, have some kind of camaraderie there that makes it a place that you want to, that you want to work at, that you want to be mm-hmm. having clarity of um, a, an employee manual. Um, we've done some work on this in the past, sharing what some growers have developed, just that everyone's on the same page of what all the policies are. And, you know, most farmers get into farming because they like to grow things. And this is another one of those things who, you know, HR skills is not something <laughs> that's sort of intuitive, right? You need to be aware of, I guess, the science behind it, I'd say. And there's a lot of that. And so one of the things are, what are the what are the expectations? What are the boundaries of behavior? What are the rewards of good performance? To have those things clearly demarcated is really helpful to keep in, keep in good people. Yeah, no, absolutely. Do you feel that Vermont is starting to get saturated? Yeah, well, it depends, you know, what you're talking about as far as direct market horticulture. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of growth in the past few decades and our population hasn't grown. There's been a shift in consumers somewhat with the enthusiasm for local markets and produce, but that's not a never-ending growth. That's probably engaged most of the people that can be engaged that have the uh, disposable income and the interest and the you know, awareness of the, the benefits. So there's some cannibalization. There's also a bigger problem in a way, I think, is just it's so much easier to get good food than mm. it used to be. So whether it's you know, the co-ops, even the supermarkets, the, you know, the online ordering, the delivery services, all kinds of CSAs, you know, more and more farmers markets. So I just use myself as an example. I belong to a CSA, live in a small town with a really big food co-op with a lot of local products. Uh, let's see, there are three different farmers market locations just in this town and wow. another, you know, farmers markets probably in five, six other towns in the county and there were no CSAs in my town when I started. Now, I mean, there's, what, three in just this little town and 10 or 12 yeah. in the region. So, yeah, it's a much more competitive environment than it was uh, not that long ago. Yeah. And then food prices are not going up. So that's, mm-hmm. you know, at the wholesale level, you certainly hear this from producers all the time. They've been pretty flat for a long time. Costs are going up. So, um there's still a lot more opportunity and flexibility in horticulture than in, in commodities where the prices are set from afar, but it's definitely a challenging market environment. Yeah. So new growers, are you seeing them branching out into more of prepared foods? Or I see some people doing, let's say, medicinal herbs, mushrooms, that kind of stuff. Is that where a lot of the growth is happening or just the cannibalization? Well, I mean, there still are niches. So yeah. there's a small or modest sized town or two and there's nobody right nearby and Again, so part of it is appropriate scaling. You're not going to have a 300-member CSA, but maybe you can do 100 and sell some direct-to-store. So direct-to-store has been a big growth area recently, I think. Mm. Um, There's been a big differentiation. It kind of was all wholesale when I started. If you didn't direct market, it was just wholesale. And now direct-to-store pays a lot better than distributor, obviously, and also the relationship part. So they're helping you market you know, there's point of origin labeling on products and pictures of the farms and the quality is generally superior from the local farms. So the price premium is justified. It isn't just happy talk about local. It's yeah, you know, really is better. Again, it's limited market, but where there's a bunch of people, those stores um, have been a really important piece of the success of some local farms. You even see that to some extent in supermarket chains with the right buyer and the right policy and Pricing, it, you know, it can work for some some growers. So it's just finding what's the niche in your in your area, and then yeah, some people a lot more movement into winter winter storage crops, winter greens, and there's some value added going on. It's that's probably an area where there's a lot more potential. Okay, but man, it's a whole nother <laughs> enterprise to add to your farm, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's not really farming; it's food manufacturing. So you need the facility, you need obviously the recipe and the quality of it's going to get you the price that makes it worthwhile. And then you got to market it and distribute it and store it. And so it's not something I would take lightly, but again, it's something worth looking at in some areas. I mean, jams and jellies, salsa has been going on for a long time. 
There's one farm I work with that's moved into sauerkraut. I mean, people have been doing kimchi, black garlic. There's a lot of mm-hmm. products people are trying, but it's not a particularly widespread enterprise just, I think, because it brings a lot of complexity to the farm that you have to have the management capacity to deal with. Yeah, and it's not your hands in the dirt growing stuff. It's the whole aspect of now you're probably inside managing a team of people cutting up vegetables and packaging and, and food safety. Yeah, you got some serious <laughs> food safety yeah. issues to address and a bunch of expense. And yeah, you're getting into septic systems for disposal and just, you know, it's not a pack shed. It's yeah. a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah, absolutely. So if you could, you know, standing in front of new farmers, what would you say they need to, to think about as they're starting? You said earlier, you know, you talked about the whole aspect of planning that out. Are there other areas that you'd suggest that they think about? Well, all of these planning approaches start with identifying your own goals, right? So that's yeah. that's what I do too. If, you know, one thing is, what do you really like doing? <laughs> Being clear about that. Like there might be something that makes sense on paper, but it's not yeah. going to make you happy in the long term. So that's not good being clear about what kind of net income you really need when and how much time you want to work and who are your partners and what does it look like kind of starting with that before you, you know then adding on well what do you what does it look like five years from now kind of trying to lay out a, a growth scenario that is realistic and then just all the standard stuff who being aware who are your competitors what are the risks you know that could really derail this whole thing those kind of standard planning conversations are important. And, you know, a fair number of people come, I think it's changed a lot that entry farmers now are way more thoughtful and prepared and have thought, you know, use the resources to do some of this analysis, but there's still a fair number of people that just kind of want to grow stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, maybe that's driving them a little too much without stepping back from it all. And, and I usually urge people just on a couple pieces of paper to write out a rudimentary plan I mean, and I get these inquiries sometimes from startup farmers and a fair number of them don't even do that. So, mm. it's, you know, yeah. some are more serious than others. Other people have a full-blown business plan. And again, there's often a lot of assumptions in there, like I'm going to be able to have a CSA with this many members and sell this much at a roadside stand. So since you're going to start with some assumptions, you just have to be geared up to test them. Yeah. So how am I going to track this? And when do I make a decision to pull the plug and say, wow, that's not living up to expectations. I need to re readjust. Yeah, absolutely. If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? Oh, I'd have to say the brain. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's what's so fascinating to me is my work. It's all about people. Yeah. And I've taken to saying, I don't do personality transplants. So someone's capable of this, this, and this, and they can, they don't need a market analysis. They just can sense. Yeah. <laughs> this is working. That's not, this is profitable. And, and that's great. You know, most people aren't like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually only half jesting about the brain. It's like understanding what your own brain is capable of and where your strengths and weaknesses are so that you can find the partners and support to do the things yeah. you're not good at or you don't want to be doing because it's not going to be one one tool that fixes, you know, anything. But if I had to pick a physical thing, uh, I guess I'd probably say a high tunnel. Like that's Mm -hmm. a pretty revolutionary uh, infrastructure piece over my tenure in Otho Wells and others. I just gave a talk last year, but yeah, Otho Wells, um, Elliot Coleman, people at Penn State, Steve Moore down in Carolina. You know, there were a lot of pioneers of this getting off the ground 30 years ago. And now there's just a crazy number of them and more going up every year. And so with some of the other threats we talked about, unpredictable weather and climate change and even soil health. And I mean, wow, they, they allow you to control a lot of factors. And as you well know, cause you've used so many of them. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, the productivity, we just crunched the numbers on, on high tunnel tomatoes and, you know, kind of blew my mind. The, the uh, statistics service reports outdoor field tomato yields, like the average of the last five years in Vermont, something like 11,000 pounds to the acre. Okay. And then we were, we did a survey of 20 farms across the region and they were getting from one to five pounds per square foot depending yeah. on their cultural practices. And yeah, the determinants are, you know, 20 foot tall greenhouse varieties. But um, you think about that one pound is 20 tons to the acre. <laughs> wow. You know? Yes. And yes. a lot of people are getting three and four pounds. So talking 60, 80,000 pounds to the acre. Yeah. Like, wow, why would you grow outside? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, it, those tunnels pay for themselves within the first crop, usually. Yeah. If you're so, at retail prices. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then so many things go away. I mean, they'll worry about a lot of nutrient management. Mm -hmm. I mean, you still got to manage nutrients, but you're not going to have the erosion and the leaching. I mean, you have different things, salt accumulation, et cetera. Um, Yeah. You can use beneficial insects and habitat plants. Like just your, your level of control is a lot better. Um, no, that's, I, I think you're absolutely key with that is that, you know, when we, so one of the things we did with the farmers we work with is we started breaking down everything to a, a cost per square foot or profit per square foot week. So basically we said, if you grow this crop over the entire lifespan and then divide it from basically every week that it's taking up space in your field, what does that make you? You know, one of the things that made the most money was uh, salad mix, you know, salanovas um, is like a $1.40 a square foot week. You know, that's the only thing that beats tomatoes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for us, and this was, I think, with some lower numbers because we didn't want to, you know, obviously look perfect solutions, but 40 cents a square foot week was kind of one of the numbers we came up with for greenhouse tomatoes. And so obviously, if you kind of, you know, back that up over a 20 week season, you kind of see that that's, you know, $8 a square foot, which I think that comes back to about two pounds per square foot. Yeah, the numbers I've just been looking at, there's enterprise budgets, Cornell, Iowa State, um, say $3 a pound and three, three pounds a square foot. I mean, both those universities showed a net just over $3 a square foot in tomatoes. Wow. And winter greens. So this is what's interesting. If you're doing the typical sequence, tomatoes into winter leafy greens, there's less data there. But, you know, long story short, these these tunnels, a typical tunnel, 24 by 96 or something, it's, um, what did we come up with? 27,000 gross or something. And net's going to be dependent on your expenses and everything. But if, even if it's a quarter, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, I think the challenge, of course, is most people need a crop mix. I mean, once you get into being a commodity quote yeah. unquote, grower of one, all your eggs in a basket or is a different uh, level of risk. So yeah, you're going to grow things. So I don't make the most money, but makes sense in rotation and for marketing. That's one thing. And then a lot of really high value things, you just can't sell that much of them. I remember one farmer saying to me, you know, parsley was the most profitable thing on his farm, but can't grow more than a thousand row feet of it and sell it. Yeah. So, so there's that of just uh, thinking through what's the right mix, but having the numbers. And the other thing I think is really important is farmers working together. So, you know, sweet corn is a tough crop to grow and make much money on compared to a lot of other things. It's kind of mm-hmm. good for the rotation in the field, et cetera. But it's also something, you know, you can buy in from other growers and, and just promote the local ag community. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're land limited, especially those crops are really hard to justify in your rotation. Do you know if sweet corn makes more money than let's say silage corn? I mean, obviously I think it would with the prices dairy is getting right now. I can't say offhand. I mean, one obvious issue is the, you know, the equipment's so different. So yeah. I'm not going to gear up to do silage corn on any <laughs> small yes. scale. And then also the pricing for sweet corn's changed a lot in recent years. I mean, nobody sold sweet corn by the air until I don't know when that started, certainly in the last decade. And, and it used to be a race to the bottom because you were up against there were dairy farmers selling sweet corn for $2 a dozen when I started. Wow. So it's at least come up to some reasonable price level. But again, I see it, if, if you're putting the stover back into the soil and, you know, there's a value of having it as a rotation crop too that mm-hmm. you uh, factor in there. And then a lot of people stands, you no, know, it's a super traction to get customers in. So there's that. So there's a lot of these intangibles where it's really important to have numbers, but you've got to synthesize them with the kind of non-numerical information you have. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about the SAIL program. I know that's a large part of what you do. Um, and in particular, the farmer grant program through that. Yeah, so half my job is coordinating the Northeast SARE program. It's a USDA funded grants program. And one thing that's cool about it is it's run at the regional level. So there's the four USDA regions. So it's not centrally administered in Washington. We have an administrative council. It's made up of farmers, researchers, educators, and they um, make the decisions about the grants ultimately and they guide our policy. So it's pretty grassroots and pretty tapped into the local. Uh, needs and issues, and those people rotate on and off. So I always get new perspectives. And we have six different programs, number for researchers and ag professionals like Extension and NRCS, et cetera. But uh, the Farmer Grant, it's all about farmers exploring ideas and doing research on their own farms, but not just for their benefit. What they find needs to be shared with a larger community. And a farmer can get up to $15,000 
for that. And that money can be used to pay for the time involved in doing that uh, inquiry and supplies associated with it, travel, things like that. Um, so yeah, there are just a lot of great innovative projects um, that happen every year. And you can read about them online at the Northeast Air website. I mean, a couple that come to mind going way back, was it Ron Culsa had a grant to figure out how to convert old uh, G's to electric. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he figured that out and put all the designs online. And a lot of people have done that since. Um, So that's a cool one. There's been a number of number of on farm cover crop kind of trials, people doing different things, trying to heat greenhouses with compost and different fuels. Um, Lots of lots of different pest control approaches. Um, there was a whole study on the SWD netting that we mentioned earlier, looking at how effective it was and building a you know, structure and a vestibule to allow for easy entry. So the list goes on and on, but I just love that it's driven by farmers' ideas and it makes it pretty easy for farmers to get some support. You do need a technical advisor that's required, but that can be another experienced farmer. It can be a consultant, an extension person, an agency person, but somebody to work with you when you draft the proposal and to be there to help you succeed in your project. Mm, That's good. What are resources that you see farmers underutilizing? Because I know that's a huge part of what you do is just putting out resources. And where can people find, A, find more about what you guys do? And what are some other resources you feel are underutilized? Uh, So grants is one area. And I should say the Sierra Farmer Grants are due usually the end of November. But there are a bunch of other opportunities, um, especially crop um, block grants. A lot of states have some kind of economic development grants. In Vermont, we have Working Lands Enterprise. Um, NRCS has um, conservation innovation grants that can help fund equipment. So just getting familiar with that, either building your own grant writing skills or finding someone who has them who can take your ideas and put them into the form, um, especially when you want to make a leap into a new a new enterprise to be able to do a, the pilot work, the pilot studies, the tests that are important to success, that there's public monies available for that. The conferences, as I mentioned, are important and it is kind of remarkable how, <laughs> how many farmers won't travel very far. <laughs> mm. And it's not just farmers, it's even, it even took me a long time to get to the Great Lakes Expo, for example. Yeah. And when you do, you're like, wow, there's like a whole nother set of people and knowledge and equipment's different and it's not that far away. But, you know, I went to Ontario last year. That was cool. I know good growers I work with, man, they're going to Europe, they're going to California, just taking those busmen's holidays to learn things and see farms that are not kind of doing similar systems like the Northeast tends to do and often have some things really dialed in just because they've been doing it so long and have uh, the industry support to have the right equipment and things like that. That. So that's that's one thing I'd say is uh, underutilized. And you know, then yeah, find the I mean, there's incredible newsletters coming out, and just getting those heads up of pests are on your way. Here's a new piece of equipment or a test someone's doing, and being able to read those in industry magazines. So yeah, just doing kind of the the literature work, I guess, is <laughs> lack of a better word. People are taking a lot of effort to write these things up. And then, of course, there's stuff on blogs and Facebook groups. And so, you know, it's overwhelming because there's so much of it, but at least kind of spreading your wings once in a while and looking for some new things that you haven't been following and then just cherry picking among those. Wow, this one seems like it's really full of information I could use that you wouldn't have known it was there before. Yeah. Now, you have quite an extensive website at the Vermont Veg and Berry Group, right? I maintain um, the Vermont Vegetable and Berry pages, yep. And yeah. I don't know that I'd say it's one of the better ones. I mean, I tell people it's kind of like a Rolodex of stuff for me. It's when I find things that are useful, I put them up there in links. It's kind of out of control because <laughs> got to keep going back and fixing links. But, you know, all the veg production guides, so our association of growers, the links to that stuff, and then crop by crop information, Uh, There's a little section on management that has, you know, links to all the wholesale prices and Boston terminal markets, farmers markets reports, things like that, stuff for beginning farmers. And, you know, again, just picking from around the country, Oregon, Kansas, you know, how do I start my farm? What do I do with my farmland? Just because, again, there's a certain audience, that's what they want. And then a lot of case studies, done stuff on renewable energy and weed control. And so um, that's just where I store a lot of stuff. It's a little tricky to navigate, but that's kind of my brain unpacked (laughs) into the web. And then links to other places that really focus on some great stuff. Yeah, the Cornell High Tunnel site, I think I mentioned, their cover Mm -hmm. crops. There's, uh, you know, fantastic info on potatoes from Maine and Idaho and blueberry grower stuff in New Jersey. And so it's just as I found these things, I put links up to them. 
And you have some conference proceedings and stuff as well there. Yep, which is that's great. something else. And again, a grower suggested this one. So why don't you make it easy for me to find the proceedings? So yeah, I link back to all the New England vegetable and fruit conferences, all the Vermont vegetable and berry grower conferences. I put all the slides from all the talks up year by year. There's links to the mid-Atlantic and talks I've given. And we just had nutrient management workshops around the state. So all the presentations people put together for those are up there. So just if you weren't able to make an event, you can at least see the, the images and words people were able to offer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also the New England Vegetable and Fruit Conference is, in my opinion, one of the top vegetable conferences in the in the nation. And yeah, I mean, so I think this episode will air sometime midsummer. Um, mm-hmm. We have we have quite a number of episodes actually backed up um, to get out there. But yeah, that will still give them plenty of time to it's always the first is it the first weekend in December. The 2019 New England Vegetable and Fruit Conference is actually the second week of December, December 10th through okay. 12th. So it's three days, usually a thousand plus farmers, 1,700 people all together, big trade show. And it is a really good place for market grower, sort of wholesale direct to store. It's not aimed at really large commodity growers like some other conferences. And then it's a, a real mix of crop sessions, strawberries, blueberries, apples, root crops, and then issue cultural practice sessions, irrigation, cover crops, post-harvest handling. Um, yeah, it's only every other year. It's really well worth getting to if you can, pretty reasonably priced too. Yeah. And I think one of the best part is the farmer to farmer sessions, which are run too. Um, right. Because, so yeah. in between those uh, sessions of talking heads, which is hard to have discussion when there's a couple hundred people in the room. Yeah. There's great sessions where growers get in a circle and it's a facilitated sharing of knowledge. Absolutely. So yeah, it's definitely um, a top conference. I'm going to be there this year and highly recommend if you're interested in, you know, a deep dive into all things growing, then it's a great conference for you as well. All right, Vern, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, you My pleasure. Back, yeah, a ton of different things here. I just, I got pages of notes um, that I took while we were we were talking. So um, can't wait to get this out for people and uh, really appreciate what you do. You've always been one of my heroes in the, the Northeast and I've always looked forward to the, the different newsletters and stuff you put out. Well, you're too kind. I appreciate the words. And uh, you're a rock star yourself, Michael. I'll tell you, I remember, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> you were like 20 years old, you gave your first talk at, was it New England or somewhere else, Vermont? And like, everyone was like, whoa, this guy has got it going on, man. <laughs> yes. I, I Gosh, I think that I could have been 20. No, you weren't much older. I, no, I wasn't. I could barely drive. <laughs> and, uh, but I mean, it's great. And that's one thing I appreciate this community. You know, the older growers, instead of feeling challenged by young people, that's like really satisfying. Oh, look, there's new blood coming into this industry that's smarter than us. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And they're just so open to share. I mean, Howard Prusik, you got, you know, Jack Mannix, um, you know, who over there, those yeah. guys just, you know, been doing it a long time and more than happy to, to kind of share exactly how they're doing things. So. Yeah. It's a long list of farmer mentors we got up here and, and they're everywhere too, you know, Maine, New York, Mass, everywhere you go. Agriculture is a community of people that is doing something really tangibly real and valuable. And I think that just speaks volumes to the kind of people and how they behave. It's really a good thing in this kind of age of turbulence (laughs) to be hanging out with productive people who are part of this strong community. Thanks so much for having me on here. Really appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Vern. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.